We'll go ahead and take it and turn to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33 is where we'll be for Sunday school this morning. Being with, uh, being with the college, I remember traveling, um, even as a little boy, 9, 10, 11 years old, uh, traveling with the different music groups that would go out from the college. Sometimes it's small quartets, sometimes it's trios, sometimes it's a larger choir of 16, 17 people. Um, but I always have loved to travel with the school, and I remember even from being a, a, young, a young boy traveling with my dad, and as he would take one of the different groups uh, out and about in the country, usually somewhere in, the, in about three hours radius from the school, and we would go out and, uh, and represent the college. And, and that's been one of my favorite things to do as a student has been now to participate in that uh, and being able to come in as, uh, as an actual singing member instead of just you know, a little boy on the side. So, uh, but I've enjoyed doing those, those, those things, traveling, but there's one experience that I remember that sticks out in my mind uh, from I think it was my freshman year when I was traveling. I think this one was one of the, the, the larger choirs. It's called the Ensemble, and we have 16 people, four people from uh, each part of the choir. And I remember it was a, it was a Sunday night, and usually on Sunday night, <clears throat> what, the, what the churches would do is that they would have sack lunches for us, and they'd put them, they'd, uh, you know, wrap up some sandwiches and put them in some paper bags, and they have apple and water, you know, different stuff like that in there. That way we could take it on the road and get back to the school by a decent hour instead of sticking around and eating a meal and, and taking time. And so I remember there was one trip that we made, and I can't exactly remember where, but I want to say it was somewhere in North Carolina. Maybe it was near the the Raleigh area, but I, I can't remember. I know it was a long drive, and so they made us some sack lunches, and inside the sack lunch, one of the things that they did was that they put condiments in there, like little um, mustard and mayonnaise packets <clears throat> and those kind of things, because you know, if you're from the south, you like mayonnaise, and if you're from the north, you like mustard, and some people like both, and some people like neither. But regardless, they, you know, they, they, you want to put something on your sandwich. And so I remember being in the van with a bunch of other guys, and it was dark outside. I mean, it was probably towards getting closer to winter, maybe towards December, something like that. And so it was dark outside already. Couldn't really see what we were doing. Have to pop the lights on the van and get what little light we can, trying to make our sandwiches in the van while it's bumping around and such. And I remember I... I, I I took mayonnaise out and I put some mayonnaise on my sandwich and I might have put some mustard on there too. I don't, I don't remember for sure. And, um, and as I was doing that, I was, I was getting ready to finish up and take a bite. I, I heard someone else say, Ugh, this does not taste right. And, and so we stopped and we was like, well, what's, what's the problem? He's like, I don't know. This tastes weird. And, and, and so he, he looked at, his, he looked at his, the, the, his condiments, his mayonnaise, and he had an extra one, and, and, and he opened it up, and instead of being that milky color that mayonnaise is supposed to be, it just looked clear. And I, if you know anything about mayonnaise, you know that if it looks clear, something's bad wrong about it. It's been sitting out, or it's expired, or something's not right with it. Something did not go right. That mayonnaise was spoiled. And I was thankful that I had not eaten my sandwich yet. I think I was able to take a piece of meat off and, and get most of the condiments off and I was able to save myself from a little bit of trouble but boy there were a lot of us that night who were missing our condiments on our sandwiches because something was wrong with the packaging it said that it was alright but it certainly wasn't how does that transition to Exodus 33 Well, when we look at Exodus 33 I want us this morning to see a man who is labeled for what he truly was and if there's ever a time that we needed people in our country now to be genuine Christians, to be true men and women of God, and not to, to be labeled one thing on the outside and be something totally different on the inside, today is the day that we need that. You know, that, that mayonnaise, we thought it was good. We thought it would be great to add to our sandwich and we come to find out it wasn't on the inside what it looked like on the outside. And it seems pretty characteristic to me that, especially in our Christian culture in America today, we say that we're one thing on the outside, but we're one totally different thing on the inside. And when we look at the great men of the Bible, when we look at people like David and like Paul and like we will this morning, Moses, and when we look at them, the one thing that sticks out to me the most about them is that they're consistent through and through, is that what they were on the outside wasn't it something that they put on? It was just a genuine outpouring of what was already 
very well steeped on the inside. And Exodus 33 is one of my favorite chapters in Moses' life because it really gives us a deep dive into who Moses was as a man of God. And so this morning as we look at the idea of being a man or a woman of God, I want to ask you a question, and that is, are you growing old or growing up? Are you growing old or growing up? Because I found for myself, even as being a little boy, you know, one of your favorite things to do is, is, is to have your birthday. Because you're looking forward to growing older. But as you grow older, God also wants us to be growing up. But all, that's especially true spiritually. God wants us, as we grow older, to be growing up. To be growing deeper in our relationship with Him. To be developing as Christians. And so this morning, I want to ask you that question. Are you growing old or are you growing up in the Lord? So let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Father, we thank you for the morning. We thank you for this time. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless the, the, the teaching of your word. I pray that you'll give me guidance as I share some thoughts from the life of Moses from this chapter this morning. We pray that you'll be with us and show us exactly what we need to change. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Being a man of God is something that bears um, a respect and honor about it throughout the whole Word of God. Uh, it's both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There's several different people uh, that, that bear this title, the man of God. Usually the title of the man of God is one that was given to God's servant, be it a, a prophet in the Old Testament, be it a preacher in the New Testament. And so I want to take a minute and look, just look at a couple of those uh, um, people who were called men of God. You can follow along if you like. If not, then I'll read these verses out. But in, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7, um, the, the prophet prophet Samuel was called a man of God. It says, Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. And so what's going on in 1 Samuel here? Well, this is getting to the point where Saul is about to be anointed the king over Israel. And so he's, Saul is, this is before he's chosen, this is before anything happens, and what he does is he tries to go out and to find his, his father's lost donkeys. And he says, uh, we, don't, we don't have any sort of a present. You know, we need to go see the seer, but we don't have any sort of a present or anything to give to the man of God. And so the man of God was, was used in reference to Samuel, because obviously we know later that he, he went looking for Samuel. Where's the seer? And he says, Samuel says, I am the seer. So the man of God, it was a title that was used for Samuel to represent his position as being a, a judge and as being a leader over the people of Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we're introduced to this character named Elijah. You might be familiar with him. In verse 18, it says, And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin into remembrance and to slay my son? And then in a couple of verses later, it says, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is truth. So what's going on in this passage? Well, Elijah is, is um, if I remember right, Elijah is traveling through, and, um, and, and, and there's, this, there's this woman um, who had, who, I'm getting my stories mixed, I'm mixing it up with Elisha. But in this story here, there's the woman who had a son, and the son died, and, um, and, and, and she, was, she was blaming Elisha. It was because there was, she was at the, the Elisha, excuse me, Elijah was at, the, don't, don't worry about it, you mix up the two, I'm sure, too. Um, Elijah, he was staying at the widow's house. And this was when Elijah was going through, he was at the brook Cherith, and now he's at the widow's house, and eventually then he'll go to Mount Carmel and such. And so when the, the widow's child uh, died, or, or, then um, he, she, was, she was just turmoiled, she was struggling, she, she was blaming him, and she says, that you're, you know, you're the man of God, and, and why are you letting this happen? But then, after Elijah performed the miracle, uh, then she said, now by this do I know that thou art the man of God. 
Again, just another reference to see that be it be it Saul or, or, or be it a widow woman, there, it was, there was this common title that was in place that was used for the man of God. It was someone who spoke by the word of the Lord. You may notice Lord is all caps. That means Jehovah, the God of Israel. It was someone who was recognized as being a preacher of the word of God. That happened again in 2 Kings chapter 1 at the end of Elijah's life where he's calling down fire on this group of 50 after group of 50 after group of 50. It's, it's a humorous story to me, but at the beginning of it in verse 10, it says, And Elijah answered and said unto the captain of the 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee. And guess what happened? Fire came down and consumed them. So again, just all throughout the Old Testament, it, it says it of Elisha, it says it of David, and it says it of some other people as well. There's different places in Scripture where this title, man of God, is used for someone that's not just a, a normal person, not, not just a normal, uh, everyday Israelite. This is one who had a special recognition for having a relationship with God that was very close. If we look in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 6, he's uh, Paul is talking to Timothy, he's saying, but godliness is contentment. But godliness with contempt in his great gain, and they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And then later down it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. And again in 2 Timothy says, That all scripture is given by inspiration, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So I, I say those things to say this, being a man of God, it's something that's not to be taken lightly. Having that kind of a relationship with God was something that had such deep respect. It had an aura about it in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's used of, of, of God's preacher. And Moses himself is, is, is deigned with having the title of being the first man to be called a man of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, it says, And this is the blessing where with Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel. Psalm 90 says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And so, of all the places to look this morning, of all the people to look at, we get to look this morning at Moses, this man of God, this man who had a special relationship with God, one who talked with God almost as if it was face to face, one who had a special relationship with God, even more so than the rest of the children of Israel had, but... It's not just a relationship that's for Moses. And it's not just a relationship that's for David. It's not just a relationship that's for Samuel or for Elijah. It is a relationship that you yourself can have with God and ought to have with God. A relationship that as a New Testament believer with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, you have the ability and the privilege to be a man or a woman of God yourself. And so of all the places and of all the people to look this morning, as we, as we study what it means to be a person of God, I'd like us to look at Moses. And they begin in verse 7 of chapter 33. Exodus 33, 7 says this, And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses." I'll give you a little bit of context here. In Exodus chapter 32, this is the very famous story of the, the golden calf. Moses had gone up onto the mountain, and the children of Israel, under Aaron's leadership, had made the golden calf, and had begun sacrificing to this instead of to the Lord. And the Lord was wroth with them, so much so that he, he wanted to wipe out the children of Israel and to start again with Moses. And in verse 32 of chapter 32, Moses is pleading with God and he says, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and he can't even complete the sentence because he's so burdened with the weight of their sin as the leader 
of the children of Israel as having this close relationship with God, Moses was so borne down with their sin. Because of Moses' intercession, God had mercy on the people of Israel as a whole, but at the beginning of chapter 33, he says, all right, I'm not going to destroy you, but I can no longer remain in your, in your presence. And so in the beginning couple of verses there, verses 1 through 6, and even bleeding over into verse 7, God instructs Moses to take the tabernacle that was in the middle of the congregation and move it to the outside of the congregation to represent his distancing himself from that relationship that he had with Israel. He hadn't forsaken them, and he was still going to lead them through, but at this point, because of their sin, because of the consequences that were there, they were driving a wedge between themselves and God, and God was visualizing that by removing the temple outside. And it said that anyone who wanted to go to seek after the Lord would have to go outside the congregation to this tabernacle. In fact, that's what we find Moses doing in verse 8. It says, when Moses went out to the tabernacle, all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door. They were all watching him. Because as Moses went by, everyone knew what Moses was doing and they knew the relationship that he had with God. But you know what that meant? Instead of being easy for the children of Israel to worship the Lord, instead of for it being something that was more, more casual or more something that was, that was just more convenient for them, now they had to make a special point if they wanted to go out to the tabernacle. Not as if they didn't before, they, they still had to before, but it was certainly a lot further away than it was in the beginning. But what we see Moses doing is that he's making a point to seek out God. And that's the first thing that I like us to see, is that a man of God seeks God out God. A man of God seeks out God. The most important part of your Christian life is your relationship with your Savior. And this relationship is not one that can, can be done passively. It's not one that we can just let coast or let ride. It has to be something that we actively, that we diligently pursue each and every day. Maybe you've heard it compared to meals before. If you go without meals, if you go without eating for too long, you're going to get weak. You're not going to be able to function. And it's the same way with your relationship with the Lord. If you just go passively, if you let things coast, then eventually your spiritual life is going to start to weaken and it's, starting, it's, it's going to start to corrode. Because it doesn't have that strength and that vigor from being in a direct relationship with the Lord. And that is one of the strongest points in Moses' life, is that he had a close, personal, direct relationship with God. And if we want to look to see ourselves about what we need in our own lives, what components do we need in our lives to be a man or a woman of God in the same way that Moses was, the first thing that we have to incorporate is that we have to seek God. And we have to do so intentionally. But how do you seek out God? Well, Moses sought for the, the place of God, the presence, the tabernacle that was there. We already said in verse 7 that he pitched it outside the tent. But he knew that the tabernacle was the place where God met with his people. You remember that the cloud by day and the fire by night sat over top of the tabernacle, representing God's presence there at that place. Now, the amazing thing is that as, as New Testament believers, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us, and we can make any place our place of worship. And we can connect with the Lord. We can, we can spend time with Him at any place because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost now. But in Moses' day, this tabernacle represented the place of God, the place where he could go to seek out God. Do you have places in your life where you know that you can go to seek out the Lord? Certainly we know that one of those is church. It's called the house of God. Because this is where God's people meet, and that where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. God's, God's church is one place that we can come to if you want to seek the Lord. And I can say for sure that if you're not in church, then how can you have much of a relationship with God if you want to keep building and growing if you're not seeking out this very important place in His design. Now, I know that if you're here and you're, you're listening, then you're at church, and that's a good thing. And I want to encourage you not to forsake that. 
Because sometimes when things get hard or, or when, when problems come up, then one of the first things we like to do is we like to cut out things like church. But if we're going to be a man or a woman of God, we need to seek out the place of God. You know, like we said, church isn't the only place that you can seek out God. In fact, one of my favorite things to do in my walk with God is just to find a place outside, maybe on the ball field or, or maybe on the porch, and just sit and just spend some time with the Lord. And you can make any place your altar as a Christian in our New Testament era. Do you have a special place where you spend time with God each day? Maybe it's a special room or a special chair that you kneel down at, or maybe it's just a special porch or something like that. There's places over at the college campus that, that are special to me because those are places where I go when I want to set my face to seek the Lord. And if you do that, if you seek the Lord and you seek the place where He is at, then the Lord will come and meet with you, just like He did with Moses. But more than just seeking the place of God, Moses realized that having a place and being in a set place doesn't automatically mean that you're on good terms with God. More than being at the place of God, Moses sought to be at peace with God. Moses sought for the peace with the children of Israel. In, in Exodus 32, the very chapter beforehand, he went to his special place and he went and he knelt down and he cried out to the Lord that he would forgive them of their sins. So much so that he said that if that will not forgive their sin, if not blot me out, I pray thee. Moses was, was seeking God's peace with his people so much so he was willing to forego God's peace with himself. That's a demonstration of a true leader right there. But what Moses realized was that if God was going to be powerful in the children of Israel, then he had to be at peace with the children of Israel. And sin disrupts that peace. And I want to ask you, is there something in your life that is disrupting that peace between you and God? Is there some sort of sin or is there some sort of unbelief or is there something, something that's holding you back and keeping you from having peace with God? Because Moses realized that you can be in a place and not have peace with God. If, if you've been a parent before, then you would know this. And, and certainly if you're a child, if you've been a child before, which everyone in this room has, then you would know this. Parents and children may be in the same place, but that does all, doesn't always mean that they're on the same terms with each other, if, if you know what I mean. I've never been a parent before, but I certainly have been a child, and there's been plenty of times where I've been close to the place of my parents and not been on good terms with them. Sometimes that comes in the form of getting a paddling. You're very close to each other, and yet not very close to each other. Why? Because there's something that came in between that disrupted that peace. Something that I did, something to disobey, something where I messed up, and something came in between me and my parents. And I may be physically close, but there's certainly a distance socially between us. And it can be the same thing between us and God. It's easy for us to come to church. It's easy for us to sit down and, and to read our Bibles or, or to do those things. And sometimes we just get to a point where we kind of go through the motions and we forget to realize that not only do we need to be in the right place, but we need to have peace with God. And if there's something that, that, is, that is disrupting your relationship with God this morning, then I want to encourage you to make peace with God, to seek His, His, to seek His forgiveness. Because Moses recognized that having peace with God was essential to being a man of God and to having a powerful spiritual life. If you're going to seek out God, there's several characteristics that you would need to have. And the first one of that, as we've been saying, is, is to be intentional or to, to have purpose. To be, to be intentional, like we've been saying, it's something that actively happens. You know, when you think about the life of Moses, you think, man, there were so many things that, that Moses did. I mean, he had millions of people that he was overseeing, that he was trying to, to lead through the wilderness and up into the promised land. And he had so many things that he, was, that he was constantly doing on an everyday basis. We don't even know. We only know some of the highlights. But we know that earlier in his life, 
he was having a pretty prominent position of, of being a judge over the people of Israel. And Jethro came along, his father-in-law, and he saw the, the, the great burden that he had from sun up to sun down just judging all of the, the different cases in Israel. And he said, hey, you need some help. You need to delegate some of this. And so you can imagine, even though Moses was able to delegate some responsibilities, just the busyness of Moses' life, the things that he had to oversee. If you have to oversee two to four million people, you're going to be busy. But the thing that stands out to me is that Moses' relationship with God never seemed to suffer, even though he had all of these responsibilities. When God told him to come up to the mountain, he stayed there for days and days on end. Or whether he was among the children of Israel, listening to their complaints day in and day out. Constantly, whatever situation that we see Moses in, we see that he has this vibrant relationship with God. Because it was one that Moses made a priority. Moses knew that his strength was not within himself. His strength came from God. And he knew that if he was going to be able to have the ability to lead the children of Israel then he needed that relationship to be vibrant. So you know what Moses did? He made his relationship with God intentional. As Moses sought the Lord, he made a point that he would intentionally seek the Lord. And you would say, well, that was Moses' job. You know, he's supposed to lead the children of Israel. God told him to come up on the mount, so that's his job. And it's, it's not the same for me. Well, no, 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 no. It, it is the same for us. Because our relationship with the Lord is, is one that should be first and foremost in our lives. Your relationship with God will define everything else about the rest of your life. And regardless of whatever that you do in life, regardless of whether you're, whether you're in a position of, of spiritual leadership or not, wherever you're at in life, your relationship with God needs to be something that you intentionally prioritize. Like I mentioned earlier, I graduated this past spring with my music major, and one of the things that I did as a part of my music major was uh, taking piano. And uh, I didn't take piano because I necessarily had to. I actually took piano because I wanted to. Uh, I'm one of those students, so. Um, but I, I love playing the piano. And one of the things that always kind of, it, 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 it just, it kind of <clears throat> rubbed me hard sometimes was that Every week I had to do five hours of piano practice. So that's one hour every weekday. And when you're doing classes from 7 a.m. until 2 p.m. and then you're working until 4 p.m. and then you eat, I mean, you don't have a lot of extra time except for the evening where you're supposed to be studying for your other classes. And it was always a struggle for me to juggle around that, that time to try to fit my piano practice in. But I knew that I had to get at least four and really four and a half hours a week to kind of scrape the bottom of the barrel of, of keeping my grade and not letting it drop. And so I made the best effort that I could to get those four, four and a half hours of piano practice every week, even though it was taking up a lot of time that I could have easily used for something like homework or, or other things. I made it a priority because I knew I did not want my grade to drop and to affect the rest of my GPA. And so I made it a point that even as much as it might hurt some of my other things, I am going to do my piano practice. Now, many of you in here would probably say, I'm going to make it a point not to play the piano. <laughs> and that's fine. But the thing is, I knew the priority that my piano practice was, and I made a point to make sure that it was done. And if you're going to be a man of God, or if you're going to be a woman of God, it's not something that's just going to happen because it happens. It's not going to be something that you can just, you, you can just go through the motions and, 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 and watch yourself grow. It's something that you have to do intentionally. Especially in my position where I'm at school and classes start at 7 in the morning and you're going at homework until late at night, I've got to find a slot. Where can I spend my time with the Lord? I have to make a point of it. And it's the same for you too. Life happens, things happen, appointments happen, trips happen, but your relationship with God has to be one that you do intentionally. And constantly through Moses' life, and especially here in Exodus 33, we find that Moses is intentionally seeking the Lord. 
But more than just intentionally seeking the Lord, another thing that we find Moses doing is that he's seeking the Lord passionately. Passionately, out of love for the Lord. And out of a sense of urgency for the Lord. Moses had a a love for the Lord that challenges me and my love for the Lord. I, I don't know about you, but it's a whole lot easier for me to do something that I love than it is for me to do something that I don't love. I don't particularly care for something like shopping, but I'm a tech guy, and so I, if I have to go shopping, I like to go to a tech store, something like Best Buy or, or, or the tech section in the back of Walmart or, or something like that. That makes something that I don't like a little bit easier because I love it. But I really don't care about going to a place like Belk's or JCPenney and looking at clothes because it just doesn't strike my fancy. It's a lot easier to do something that you love than it is to do something that you don't love. And I've found in my own Christian walk, it's a lot easier for me to walk with the Lord when I love the Lord than it is when I don't love the Lord or the things of the Lord. How is your love for the Lord this morning? Because constantly we see that Moses loved the Lord deeply. And we see that Moses was urgent. I mentioned it before. I won't go back and, and read it again. But he was so urgent. He was so passionate about his, the relationship of Jehovah and the children of Israel. And, and, and it brings to my mind Isaiah 55 where it says, Seek the Lord while He may be found and call upon Him while He is near. There ought to be an urgency about ourselves. That again, just going back to the idea of being intentional and being passionate about our relationship with the Lord. That was constantly a theme through Moses' life. So first we see that a man of God seeks out God. But a second thing that I'd like us to see is that a man of God stands for God. And that's found in verse 10. Exodus 33.10 says, And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. This verse here is showing us that when Moses went out to the tabernacle, in the same way it said in verse 7, that all the people came to their doors and they watched Moses. Have you ever felt like everyone's watching you before? Maybe like when you get up and teach Sunday school or something like that? Well, you know, everyone, everyone is watching you. Or maybe, maybe you're shopping in the store and you drop a can and something falls and then everyone on the aisle just turns and looks at you. A man of God is going to be someone that people's eyes are going to be looking at. Sometimes it comes in the form of your neighbors, watching you, listening to you, seeing how that you drive off every Sunday morning and wondering where you're going, or knowing in the back of your mind that, that they're going to church. Sometimes it comes in the forms of, of friends that have hardships. And when they have hardships, who do they look to to, to to find someone that they can find help, to find balm for the hurt? They look for someone who has a relationship with God. And the man of God is one that is a spiritual force for God in public. They stand for God. There's a couple other stories in the Bible throughout the Old Testament. I won't take too much time with them. But where someone is called a man of God and we find him standing triumphantly, making a stand in public for the Lord. And the first one that comes to my mind in 1 Kings 22, where Jehoshaphat is joining forces with Ahab and they're looking to go to to invade the country. And Jehoshaphat's a little bit skeptical. And he says, "Uh, okay, Ahab, I, I hear what your prophets are saying, but... But is there not a a man of God here? Is there not a prophet of the Lord that can tell us the truth about this situation? And Ahab mutters those words, Well, there's there's Micaiah, but I hate him because he always says bad things about me. (laughs) In in, uh, in, in 1 Kings 22, verse 14, Micaiah says this as he's standing before them. He says, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. He goes on to prophesy how that as they go forth into battle, the, the, the armies are going to go forth and they'll come back as, a sh- as sheep that have no shepherd. He's foreshadowing how that Ahab was going to die in this battle. And you know what it cost Micaiah? To stand for the Lord as, as he's called in this passage, a prophet of the Lord, a prophet of Jehovah. You know what it cost him? Ahab threw him in prison and gave him the bread and the water of affliction. And who knows how long he was there. Certainly, Ahab went out to battle. He died. 
and came back, but we don't know if he was ever let loose or, or what much of what came to him afterwards. Micaiah was a man of the Lord, and he stood up and proclaimed the word of the Lord, regardless of what other people thought. In the midst, while everyone was looking at him, he was taking a stand for the Lord. And if there's a time in our country's history where we need men and women of God to take a stand and to say, Thus saith the Lord, is it not today? With all these crazy confusions going around, with all of these, the, these different controversies and these straight out blatantly unbiblical and, and demonic oppression that is out there, what, is there not a better time for us as God's people in God's house to look at people like Moses and how he worshipped the Lord, to look at people like Micaiah and how he, he proclaimed the word of the Lord and to say, I want to be a person of God who takes a stand for God in public. And sometimes it doesn't even have to be somewhere out in the midst of a crowd of people. Sometimes it can be as simple as just witnessing to your neighbor or to saying a word to the person at the cashier's desk and just giving a word of testimony to them. We know that there's a couple extreme stories like this in the Bible, like with Micaiah where he stood in front of people and he was cast into prison. But many other times, I'm sure, people gave a word of testimony. There were many times where proclaiming the word of the Lord and taking a stand for God doesn't happen in front of a crowd of hundreds or thousands of people. There's this grassroots effort that God has built into His program where God's people, if they'll simply take a stand in their little circles of influence and in public, not to stand down but to stand up, then God's people, men and women of God, can make a difference for the Lord. Moses was recognized by all the people in the congregation as having a relationship with the Lord. He stood for the Lord in public. He moved the tabernacle and maintained his relationship with the Lord in the midst of while everyone else was watching him and everyone saw the testimony that Moses had. And is that what other people see in you? The last thing that we'll see this morning about a man of God is not only that he seeks the Lord, and not only that he stands for the Lord, but finally, a man of God studies God. A man of God studies God. Listen to this at the end of chapter 33. In verses 12 to 17, he's having a conversation with the Lord about how that he needs the Lord to go with him and to help him to lead the children of Israel. But it takes an even deeper level when you get to verse 18. Moses says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for thou shalt no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and will take mine hand away, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Even further, in Exodus 34, towards the end of the chapter, it talks about how Moses' face shone, it, it, it glowed, it is just from radiating the presence of the Lord. A man of God studies God, and there are a few people in the Bible that we find who studied God more or closer than Moses did. Moses was one of the few, if not one of the only people, who saw part of God's glory. God had said that no man can see me face to face and live, so God couldn't talk with Moses as, a, as true face to face, let him see his front parts. But what he did was he put Moses in the cliff of the rock and as he passed by, he let him see his back parts as he went by. He let him see part of the very glory of God. Now this didn't just happen because God offered it to Moses. It wasn't as if God, God, God extended an offer to all the children of Israel and He says, whoever wants to see my glory, come up to the mountain at such and such a time. That's not how this worked. Moses, because of his passionate, because of his intentional seeking after the Lord, he asked God. He was begging for more of God. 
He knew what he knew and he knew that that mean, meant he wanted more. He wanted to be closer. He wanted to get to know God even more. He wanted to study the glory of God. And God allowed him this special experience. And I'm pretty sure that that fueled Moses as he kept on leading the children of Israel. And again, like we said in, in Exodus 34, in the next chapter over, Moses goes back up onto the mount because he had broken those Ten Commandments, those tablets. And so it goes back up and God creates new ones for him again. And when he comes down off the mountain, his face is shining so brightly that people are afraid of him and they have to put a veil over his face while he's talking with the people of Israel. And when he went into the tabernacle, then he would take this veil off because he was just radiating with the glory of God. Wow. Now imagine, we don't compare ourselves among ourselves, but I do want to ask you this. How close is your relationship with God? How much do you seek to study God? Because part of our culture today is just one of being casual or being shallow. And what we lose is that we lose the riches of those depths. Churches may be a mile wide, but they're an inch deep. And they lose the wonder of studying the glory of God. And sometimes, even in our own personal walks, we get into this habit where we go to church or, or where we open our Bibles and, and we read and we spend our time with God because that's what we've been doing for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And we lose a sense of the awe that's there. The awe of who God is. But remember, heaven is about having an eternal relationship with God. In a closeness that we've never had before. Heaven is all about God. And the thing that makes the Christian life so special is that we have a chance to get a taste of that now. That we have the ability to get to know our God now in an intimate and close way. The abundant life is one that is abundant with a knowledge of God and a relationship with Him. And the thing that will set you apart as a man or a woman of God, one characteristic is if you study God. More than just knowing in general about God, you know Him personally. From both experience and from Scripture, from principles and promises, from things that you've seen Him perform on your half, you have this, this multifaceted relationship with Him where you know God. That is the kind of relationship that Moses had with the Lord, as if he were talking face to face. And it was a closeness that he carried with him throughout the camp. And people could just see, they could just tell that Moses walked with God. You know one encouraging thing that that'll do? Is that it'll draw other people into, a, into wonder about what is this relationship with God about? Because one of my favorite verses in this chapter is verse 11. Chapter 33, 11. It says, And he, Moses, turned again into the camp. He was leaving the tabernacle. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Joshua caught a glimpse of the relationship with God that Moses had. And he said, I want that. And, and regardless of what stage in life that you're in, Maybe you find that you're, 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 you're over the hill, you're, you're, you're passing, passing the time away, but you know your job is not done. Your influence is not done because Moses was, near, was 120 years old when he died. He was 80 when he led, them out of the children, uh, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he's somewhere in that range, 80 to 120 years old around this time. And yet, he influenced a young man named Joshua, who after Moses passed away would rise up and continue to strongly and mightily lead the children of Israel. So much so that it wasn't until Joshua died that they started to fall off on the side. Why? Because Moses had a relationship with God where he studied God and that just beamed across his face and his life so much that young men 
we're attracted to that same relationship. And so regardless of where you're at in life right now, you still have influence. You still have the ability to be able to draw younger people into a relationship with God if you yourself bear that same wonder of the relationship with Him in your life. And so think about it this morning. As we look at Moses, we see that a man of God, being a, a person of God, is something that has a great honor and great respect. Because there's a recognized closeness in that relationship with God. But it's not something that was just for Moses or just for these other people. This is something that each one of us here this morning can have on our own personal basis. A walk with God where we seek God, where we stand for God, and where we study God. And by doing those three things, we can have an influence over the people that are around us and ultimately on our community and across the world. So I want to challenge you. Are you growing old or are you growing up? As time passes, are you staying where you're at in your relationship with God or are you making it a point to keep pressing on, to keep knowing God more? Because Moses gives us a great example that we can follow of being men and women of God today, here, and now. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Lord, we know that these are things that we cannot do without Your help. We know that we need Your strength. We need Your guidance. We need Your help to fight the enemy because he's constantly opposing us. He doesn't want us to be men and women of God. But if there's ever a time that we needed men and women of God, it's now. And I pray for those here this morning that you'll continue to encourage them along these same lines as we saw from Moses this morning that they'll make the relationship with you primary in their lives. And that it would be wonderful, so much so, that other people are drawn in with wonder at that same relationship. I pray that that will be each of our testimonies this morning. We pray, Lord, that you'll, you'll bless the rest of this day as we seek to worship you and to learn from you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.